Thank you for joining us for today's message. We believe we can go anywhere in the world from right here in Lamarck, Texas and reach people just like you. If you'd like more information about Abundant Life, please visit ALCC.org. You can also text the number below if you would like to support the church financially. Be ready for a powerful message that's gonna impact your life. Right before I get into this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 this morning, uh, I do think we need to be wise about what we see and what we're hearing because there are so many things that are coming uh, to surface right now. And Jesus said that in the end times, things would escalate. You would see it more and more. The Bible calls them birth pains. And like a, like a, a woman with, with birth pains, the Bible says, which they come of uh, of sooner and sooner and quicker and quicker and closer and closer together uh, after a period of time. If you just, you can go back and do this yourself. I'm not going to break it out for you right now. I'll just, just tell you a couple of quick little things uh, that we are living in a time where the church is supposed to be more the body of Christ. It's supposed to be more effective and more uh, powerful and more demonstrative in the ways of the kingdom of God today than ever before. We are not supposed to be less. And God knows we're not going to take our light and hide it under a bushel. Right. We're not going to sweep it under a bed, the Bible says. But exactly the opposite. We are like a city set up on a hill whose light can't be put out. Right. How many of you are glad you're more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus? Right. But just the signs that are happening today, you, you can do your own simple little analyzation of it if you just have a few minutes and, and uh, you want to use the, the internet and use your phone effectively to be able to, to find some things. Well, uh, make Mr. Google just show you all the, uh, the volcanoes. You know, that Google dude, that's, that's a smart guy, isn't it? He got a lot of information there. I sure hope he gets to, to heaven because if, if I meet him in heaven one day, I'm going to punch him in the nose. It's the first thing I'm going to do for stealing so much time. But anyway, it's amazing just look up volcano activity, big volcanoes around the, around the world today. You're not going to see them on television, uh, except rarely because they want to show you the, the fire display and the lava display. But no, you just go and look them up sometime and look how they are uh, uh, way beyond the pale right now. Massive, uh, huge things around the world in many different places. Just, uh, just volcanoes that are erupting. All of the signs that are out on the West Coast right now, especially. We're living in that day today. This is not my, this is not my Wednesday night, my Sunday morning message here today, but I just want you to hear some of this because it's there. It's there very real, and it's going to be more, not less of it. Have you ever wondered, can, will y'all give me three minutes with this? Have you ever wondered, have you ever wondered why there were chariots and horses and angels why is it in the Bible, when you see angels several times ministering spirits of God, there were horses and chariots? And the Bible doesn't just call them chariots. It calls them chariots of fire. Uh, is it possible? I'm just going to throw it out there. Uh, it is Sunday. I mean, and you might hear some of this on Wednesday night. But is it possible that in that other dimension, that other area, the spirit realm, the heavenly realm. Why, why, was, why was Elijah caught away by a whirlwind with a chariot and horses? Why did Elisha, why did God cause him to see the chariots of fire and the horsemen? All of those things with all of those angels. Okay, y'all want me to really go out on a limb? Is it possible that in the spirit realm there are there are modes of transportation that are not just the speed of thought. Why do angels have fiery chariots? Now, I don't know how to explain it. If you ask me to explain it, I'm just quoting from the Bible. But is it possible in heaven that there is some form of locomotion, some form of travel, some form of, of ability to transfer and go like that, that's not just angels with wings flopping around. Maybe you have your hot rod in heaven. I don't know. I hope so. 
I had the coolest 57 Chevy with 283 power, two speed power glide. When, uh, when we moved here, black and silver chair, it was just perfect. I don't mind telling you. Loved it. I sure hope it's in heaven. <laughs> I don't think the 63 vets will be there, but I do believe the 57 Chevys are going to be in heaven. That's my story, and I'm sticking with it. But why do, you, why do you have that type of movement? Why are they caught away that way? Why are there times God shows things like that? So if that's the case, if, everybody say if, yes. is it possible that if in the spirit realm there is transportation that's not just moving through wings? Right. I know there's horses. And I've got some dogs and cats that I used to think spoke in tongues. I mean, I'm not sure. Uh, that's my story. I'm sticking with it. And I had a couple of them. I'm like, they're not, they're not going to make it. I'm just sure they're not, especially one of those cats. But anyway, but if in that spirit realm, those spirit beings, because angels are fallen, demons are fallen angels, I mean. They were cast down, a third of them. Some people try to debate that, but that's fine. Uh, I believe what the scripture says there, and I believe that understanding is, is real, uh, that were cast down. Uh, there are some that are reserved in chains of darkness, the Bible says, until the end of the, uh, uh, of the uh, millennial reign, where they will be released to, to, to deceive anybody on the earth that will be deceived at that particular time before God sets up uh, the uh, ultimate uh, heaven on earth, the Bible says, at the end of the millennium. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Because heaven is a society, it's a culture, it's a place. Uh, it has a capital city called Zion, yes. the new Jerusalem. There are many nations, kindred, tongue, and tribe that are in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. The city of Zion, the city of heaven is one thing. Those others are very powerful. Uh, and so is it possible if angels have the ability to move with some type of technology. Can I use that term? Amen. With something like that, with fire, chariots, all of those things. Then if angels can do it, can demons do it? Amen. Yep. The Bible says that Satan claims to be the prince and the power of this dimension. And I believe that spirit of deception today and the, the, the more that technology here is advancing allows us sometimes to see some of these flying saucers, some of these particular things that will go at such unprecedented movements that even just go right straight into the water. You can see them now. This government report just came out and it's really interesting and it almost begins to bear that out. Y'all want me to keep going? Yeah. Yeah. Be here Wednesday night. <laughs> so today we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. <laughs> Hallelujah. All I can tell you is you, uh, you need to take authority and you need to be spiritually aware of the time you are living in. It's not a game, church. It's not a game. It's not a game. Hallelujah. Some of y'all are really excited because he said, you mean there's 57 Chevys in heaven? I don't know. I'm just saying I hope so. God said we can have the desire of our hearts. So there, you got one of mine right there. But I've always been just a little bit on the edge in some of these areas. I remember when I was in Sunday school, uh, I, I didn't want to read and study sometimes. We, we had Sunday school, a little children's ministry uh, when I was growing up. And I would just, I would just frustrate my Sunday school teacher, Sister Gladys, I'd say things to her like, I just don't understand why the Apostle Paul keeps writing books to Corinth and they never write back. <laughs> you know, and like, why don't they figure this out? Don't do it. And when I was a boy growing up, I didn't like to eat fish. Anybody in here? Now today, all I eat is fish and chicken. Uh, I don't eat red meat today because uh, it just doesn't, you know, when I reach 40 years old, I don't think I've had, you can count on one hand the number of steaks I've had in the last 25 years uh, because it just doesn't digest as well. So I figured it out for me, you know, you know what works for you as you grow up, you know, grow a little older. But uh, we would have fish. And when I was growing up, you know, we had a Catholic church there in the town, a little town where I was growing up. So uh, to try to 
uh, I think facilitate the Catholic Church. They had Fish Fridays. Does anybody remember Fish Friday in school? We'd have Fish Friday because, you know, they would always have fish on Fridays uh, in, in the Catholic Church, you know, in respect to Jesus some way or another. Uh, but anyway, I didn't like fish really in those days, especially it had to be really fried crisp for me to like it. And um, I told, y'all don't want me to tell y'all this. I said, I sure wish all those disciples hadn't been fishermen. I wish they'd have been ranchers, you know. <laughs> And uh, that one got me in trouble. I don't mind telling you. I got in trouble with my dad over that one. Second Corinthians chapter four this morning, Paul writes to the church at Corinth. And the church at Corinth was a charismatic mega church. Uh, and Paul writes uh, in first Corinthians, especially I've said for years, uh, it could almost be named the book of first corrections because every chapter He's trying to set in order something, not remove it necessarily from the church, but to get it in order. Right. Something that's going on inside of the church. And so there would be uh, a lot of things that he would write and he would correct. Uh, for instance, when God talks about the, uh, the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, he, he, he doesn't say don't operate in the gifts of the Spirit. He says do them in order. Understand that there's some order, there's some uh, in the house of God. And he's writing to the church and the churches at Corinth. Uh, and so as the uh, church continues to grow, he's always dealing with also his own apostleship. And so Paul, since he had not been one of the personal followers of Jesus, remember he was not converted until a few years after Jesus had resurrected and ascended. After the day of Pentecost, the apostle Paul in those days was Saul. Uh, uh, and so Saul of Tarsus. And Saul was a uh, political man and a religious man at the same time. The scriptures uh, are, are pretty well defined about his writings uh, that we have. Uh, Thirteen of the New Testament books are written by far more than anyone else uh, that writes in the scriptures. The closest to it probably would be Moses, who probably wrote the first five books of the Bible. And so Paul here is dealing uh, with the church there because not only is he dealing with their uh, lack of order and understanding and he's putting it in order. They're so charismatic. They're having tongue services where they try to preach in tongues, in other tongues. And uh, Paul says, no, no, no. He said, look, forbid not to speak in tongues. I pray in tongues more than you always. But he said, when I speak to other people, I would rather speak uh, one word in my natural dialect than a thousand words in tongues because they could not understand it. He said, now prayer is a different thing. Or the gifts of the Spirit, those are different things. But when it comes to declaring the gospel, he said, I'm going to do that in a language that people can understand. Amen. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. So there had to be some order. Otherwise, they were so zealous because of this baptism in the Holy Spirit and the demonstration of the gifts and the power of God, they were just having gift services. They're just having tongue services. This thing's way out of balance, and Paul is pulling them into order. Well, because he was that kind of a man appointed by Jesus, after the resurrection, Paul had his own encounter with Jesus who chose him personally to be the, what you and I will call the head apostle. Uh, the disciples, if you remember, who were uh, trying to figure out what do we do now on, uh, before the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 1, they decided to replace Judas. And they cast lots, which was uh, something from the Old Testament. It was a custom in the Old Testament that God had used, and they would take these stones that were kept in the breastplate of the high priest. And they would, uh, they would basically throw them. And they would roll them out and whatever their pattern, wherever they landed, somehow they had an interpretation from that. And so here we are. Uh, Jesus had just been uh, uh, ascended up uh, on high. And now here they are 10 days later. They're deciding how do we replace Judas in the 12? They said, I, I know, we'll cast lots. Well, can I just remind you that Jesus had already risen and the law was now fulfilled. And so you can't roll dice nor anything else. I'm preaching better than you're amen. You don't need that lottery thing. I'm not telling you about it. But if you do, 
hit it and you pay tithe. I won't ask you where you got the money. But uh, it's important to get this. Use wisdom in those areas. You actually have a better chance of finding a lottery ticket out on the parking lot at the 7-Eleven than you do of buying the parking lot. That's what they say, or, or, or buying the ticket inside. I just thought I'd mention that. So if you want to blow your money, just give it to God instead. Uh, but here, here's the thing. Uh, so they were always having error that would uh, be creeping up. And so that's why you see him correcting so many things, not removing things, but setting them in order. Because the church is very, the, the New Testament church is very young, formative, and growing. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Uh, and because of that, his critics rose up and they stacked up about that high too. You can be sure. He was always fighting whether or not uh, he was the man in authority from God. He was having to answer that all the time. You read it in his writings. Uh, why? Uh, and he would say, well, some people, if they're just going to be ignorant, let them be ignorant, he said in one place. Those that are going to be ignorant, let them be ignorant. He just finally knew because he knew that that relationship that God had given him and had given him a span of time in his life. He called it a dispensation. A dispensation is not a number of days, weeks, or years uh, exactly. A dispensation is a span of time. It can be a large span of time. It can be a short span of time. And he said, God has given me uh, this amount of time. So in Paul's life, it was less than 30 years from the time that he was converted till the time he went to heaven. Say amen. amen. He said, I got a short time to write this down and reveal what's called the mystery. Mysterion, a, a, an interesting word in the Greek. It doesn't mean mystic like woo. No, it means that thing which is not yet revealed. The understood, the mystery. That which has not yet been made clear. It's not yet revealed. And he said, God has given me that. And, and then he goes on in the next verse or two and he says, and here's the mystery. You ready for this? Y'all ready? Amen. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The anointing of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God Himself, not just being on you, but when you say yes to Jesus, oh, I'm about to get happy and I hadn't even started preaching yet. When He said, when you say yes, all of a sudden it gets revealed who Jesus is, the Christ, the anointed one with His anointing, and he not only lives on you, he only, not only lives with you, come on, say it with me, he lives in you. He said, it is the mystery, it's that part which was never revealed that God would tabernacle inside of men, men and women, man, mankind, that God would come inside of us. Oh, I'd like to just remind you uh, every morning, if Jesus is your Lord and you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, when you look in the mirror, you're not just looking at you. You happen to be looking at the bottle that inside of it, the container, it has the excellency of the power of God inside of a frail bottle. Oh, hallelujah. You know, I, I don't buy perfume and, and, and stuff like that because I'm a man. And, uh, <laughs> and my wife, she likes to buy her own perfume, what she likes. I mean, I'll buy her anything in the world. You know that, I'll give her anything. But she likes to pick out her own stuff, so I'll let her pick out her own stuff. I don't let her anything. She picks out her own stuff. <laughs> I learned the secret, <laughs> the mystery, men of being married 45 happy years. And now she walks into it immediately. Give her a hand as she walks in. Cindy and I will be married uh, this Friday. Uh, we will have been married 45 years this Friday. We're very excited about that. That was right on cue too when you walked in. I'm just, I'm very, I'm, I'm pretty, Pretty impressed with that one. <laughs> but I learned years ago, I don't tell her what to do uh, at all. I've, the only thing I've learned to say, guys, listen, take notes. It's deep. It's theology. It's, yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'm thrilled to have a, a, a beautiful wife 
who is not selfish nor any of those kind of things. So it's easy to live with. You can't get along with Cindy. You got a demons, all I can tell you, because she's easy to get along with. But be that as it may, she gets an extra crown for putting up with me in heaven, that's for sure. But Paul was revealing some things there. And uh, as he would uh, begin to teach and he would write these letters, there was always things coming to the surface. And in all of them, somehow he makes reference to the fact that the Holy Spirit, that God, the Word alive, the wisdom of God can actually dwell in you. Uh, you and I have a lifelong goal of learning and growing in those areas. Can I have an amen? amen. All right, I've said about all I'm going to say to set that up. I want you to listen to it right now. In, um, in uh, chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians verse 1, therefore, everybody say therefore. Anytime you see the word therefore in the Bible, Brother Hagin used to say, and I used to love it, he'd say when you see the word therefore, go and look because it means it's there for a reason, something that has just been said, and I'm just kind of leading you up to what it's there for. So therefore, that's why it's there for. Therefore, seeing, everybody say seeing. seeing. That means it's been revealed to them now. They have an understanding that Christ is in them. They're supposed to live it. Every person in the New Testament church. Therefore, seeing we, somebody shout we. we. Paul's not just talking about himself. He's talking about us. Therefore, seeing every person that's in Christ has this ministry as we have received mercy we faint not or we don't quit back off. I don't care how tough it is. I don't care how your critics line up. It doesn't make any difference. You have received a ministry. I believe that every person has something they are supposed to be doing in Christ. Amen. Everyone can be a living witness. Our lifestyle should be that way. Our language should be more like uh, the Lord every day. Now, I'm not talking about quoting uh, the old King James version of the Bible with thee and thou and thus. I just, after, after 60 years now of reading the Bible, I kind of think in King James, but there's some other wonderful uh, translations of it. But our language, our thoughts, our lifestyles, listen, we're Christians. That's why we go to church. Amen. I said, we're Christians. We go to church. I hear people say, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. Well, I'm not really sure you're a Christian. I'm going to be straight up honest with you. I, I, I mean, I'm married to Cindy, therefore I go to my house. We have a dog house out back. I only live in it occasionally. We have a dog house out back. We have our dogs. They go to their house. You got a fish bowl, it goes to the bowl. Got a bird house, it goes to, are y'all listening? You're a Christian, you go to the church house. Go to the house of God. That's why we're here today. And uh, I, I just think it's very possible, uh, necessary. And I'm also fully persuaded that hell has worked overtime in the last 18 months to stop people from going to church and to substitute that with all other mindsets of self-justification. But some things are very plain in the Bible. For instance, do not forsake the assembling of yourself together as you see that day of the Lord approaching. So either they don't see the day of the Lord approaching, getting nearer, or else they don't care, or they don't know. So you and I should live the Word of God, encourage other men and women to go to church. Come on, how many of you uh, understand, we, we, we don't have to encourage people to go to Walmart. You have to encourage people to go to the ball game. You have to encourage people to get up and go to church. Well, maybe you do to go to work. Uh, but still, you don't have to encourage people to do that. They know they're going to be fine. They go to work. They're going to go out. They're going to do what they do. But if they talk about going to church, it's like, well, <clears throat> I'm afraid I might get sick. <clears throat> well, the devil's afraid you're going to get well. And he will throw every form of deception up possible to keep people. And you know what's wild about it? I want to know how Christians are going to live or try to live for God if they miss the rapture of the church, be here Wednesday night. I want to know how they're going to live for God in the tribulation if all it took was the threat of getting sick to not go to church for 18 months. It just makes me wonder what relationship did they have before? You say, you're just being judgmental. No, I'm being a pastor. 
Oh, I'd much rather shepherd the soul of somebody than listen to somebody's just excuse. Because excuses are very common. They're kind of like noses. Everybody has one. And they smell. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry. Come on, somebody shout, I have a ministry. My time's almost up and I'm just, just now starting. As we have received mercy, we faint not. What a beautiful thought that we have received mercy. Paul says, look, I wasn't, I wasn't qualified for this personally. It's not because I'm some big, big eye and someone else is a little you. He said, no, it's the mercy of God that we have. This. And this is a guy that's being beat, stoned, left for dead, uh, dropped off into the water, uh, floating in the deep for three days and three nights, beat with rods. Uh, you'd think the guy would be complaining. But he said, it's the mercy of God that I get to minister uh, the, the revelation of the word of God. And he said, every one of us, listen, if you're going to go around saying, it's so hard to live for Jesus, please don't come tell me that. <laughs> it's not hard to live for Jesus. It's hard to fight against yourself. You just have to believe in your heart that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. Well, I know, but before I was a Christian, I didn't have any problem. No, you forgot. I said, you just forgot all those problems or you've just listened to somebody else and now you're parroting what you heard somebody else say. Christians should not now nor ever go around telling people, it's so hard to live for Jesus. It's not hard to live for Jesus. It's hard to live for the devil. And at the end of the day, you go to hell. But you live for the Lord and it's the mercy of God that we get to go to heaven one day and we get blessed in this life on the way. And so Paul is saying, it's not that there are not problems. He's, he's written a one and a half books already just about, just telling about his problems. And he's saying, but none of these things move me. He said, I'm going to go all the way with Christ. And he's saying, if you happen to see me go through a battle, just remember, he said, I will come through it, but you use it as a teaching moment that even if you go through a battle, God is going to bring you through it. Uh, Paul's real powerful. He writes the, almost those, uh, those words in more, than, in more than one place. Drop down for time, if you would, please, to verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Paul says, I have this on the inside. He said, and we have this treasure on the inside. I was talking about buying perfume and all that kind of stuff. Cindy buy the perfume, and, and she's got, uh, you know, whatever her perfume cologne type of stuff is. There's several, you know, she got two or three bottles that are out there and they're real pretty bottles. I'm like, oh my goodness, those bottles look like collector's editions. Those things are real nice. But you know, you don't buy, you, you don't buy the perfume for the bottle. You buy it for what's inside the bottle. The value's on what's on the inside, not what's on the outside. And Paul says, and we have this treasure it's a powerful, powerful Greek word. I, time's not going to let me break the Greek down to you now. But listen, this particular word just means a, an extreme wealth, like, like this massive amount of value. He said, we have this treasure in physical forms, in, contained in earthen vessels. He says, the Holy Spirit is in you. The devil tried to make you sick. You just say, wait a minute, no, wait, wait, wait a minute. My body's temple of the Holy Ghost. It is a container for the excellency of the power of God. So in the name of Jesus, I rebuke the sickness, I rebuke the infirmity, and I tell it to go. And I ask God to let that which is inside of me, the Bible calls it in Philippians 2, work out your salvation in fear and trembling, for God is at work in you to will and do his, his, his good pleasure. Get, get this in your spirit. Sometimes what's on the inside has to work out. Yes. How many of you thank God for faith? Yes. Come on, how about for the Holy Spirit? Yes. How about for the excellency of the power of God? Yes. Now look, we may only understand a little piece of that, but the portion of the excellency of his power that we have and understand, it's enough to get you victorious in this life. Yes. But you got to pour it out. You have to pour it out. You got to take the lid off of the bottle 
off of the container at some point and release it. That's what praise does. That's what prayer does. That's what obedience does. Uh, when you're serving the Lord, you're releasing the excellency of the power of God. You are not a victim. You are a container. You look in the mirror and you see the container that the Holy Spirit lives in in the earth today. He lives in you. That ought to make you cut down your sugar intake at least 50% right there. <laughs> hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. Only eat half of that box of chocolates and throw one of the Twinkie slices away. Don't eat the other one. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Whew. Good preaching for such a young preacher. But we have this treasure in earthen vessel that the excellency of the power may be of God and not, a, uh, it's not about the bottle. It's about the contents inside the bottle. Right. It's about the excellency of the power of God. It's not even about us. I said, it's not even about us. It's about us being the vessel that the Holy Spirit lives in and works through. The problem is the spirit of the individual is subject to that individual. Right. You can keep the lid on the bottle as much as you want. Or in the name of Jesus, come on somebody, you can release that excellency of the power of God, His Word, His Spirit. Do that in your home. Share the good news of Jesus at the house. Love one another. Live that lifestyle. How many of you think Christians ought to read their Bible? Amen. I mean, I know this. I'm going out on a limb with this one. Y'all ready? How many of you think you ought to read your Bible and pray every day? Amen. Sure. You may not have. I've got a brand new one right here, another new one. So I'm trying to break it in. I kind of feel like Linus without a security blanket almost because I'm so familiar with my other Bible. But after a while, you just have to transition. I have to. But... It's important. It's extremely important. You know, that's what you have an iPad for. So what you got a cell phone. Make sure you have that Bible app in there. And read something every day. Amen. I said read something every day. Amen. Make Google work for the kingdom. Come on. Amen. Look at verse two, uh, 7 one more time. Verse 7. We have this treasure in, ex, uh, in earthen vessel that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. That's why God put all of that power that takes place. Healing, deliverance, revelation knowledge, resurrection power. Come on, shout hallelujah. God put that in us so the world needs to actually say, I know they're just flesh and blood. They're no different than me. They're just flesh and blood. Yes and no. I'm just flesh and blood, but I'm different from the world because you become a new creation when the Holy Spirit comes in you. Old things get poured out of the bottle. Old things pass away. And behold, shazam, wow, all things become new. Amen. If nothing's new, you need to go check what you're pouring in the, in the, in the bottle. Whew, do I need to stick with that for a while? So the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And then Paul says, because we are troubled on every side yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. I, I really like the fact that he continues to say, cast down, but not destroyed. And then he gives one of the greatest secrets to the, the mystery of the Holy Spirit that you will ever have. In verse 10, he says, always bearing about inside this body, always keeping mindful, always having the Holy Spirit inside of this body, understanding the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life, the Zoe, the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Amen. He said, I don't care what the problem is. I'm not going to be going around telling how I'm beat, how I'm in despair, 
how I'm always persecuted, how I'm always perplexed. He said, I'm not going around giving that a lot of credit. He said, yes, it happens, but. And he said, the reason for that is, I know that bearing inside of my body is the resurrection power. It's part of the excellency of the power that if hell tries to put me down, knock me out, keep me back, stop me before uh, uh, any other, uh, literally for no reason except for the gospel, he said, I know that same power that's in Jesus is in me right now and all day long, everywhere I go, I'm mindful that if I'm having a problem, I have a solution. Let me give you the Greek for it and we'll go home. Y'all ready for this? He he called in verse seven, the excellency of the power. Verse eight, he says, we're troubled. We're troubled on every side. Watch this one. Leave that up here on the screen too. We're troubled on every side. The Greek word T-H-L-I-B-O, thlebo. Interesting. It means to be in a narrow room. It means to be uh, crowded in, pressured in like this. To just kind of be thronged about. It means high pressure. Paul said, we're, we're troubled on every side, but not distressed. The words distressed, I'm gonna, just for time, here it is. It means, but I'm not completely hemmed in. He said, I don't care what it feels like on every side. I, I'm not completely hemmed in. The Bible says in more than one place, something like this. He will make a way in a wilderness. He will cause rivers to flow in your desert. He will make a way where there seems to be no way. I wish somebody would get excited. Paul said, sometimes I'm going through some things, but, come on, somebody shout, but. I don't want to start talking about when God puts his butt in your business. I better not do that. But you'd learn how to use that word correctly and be wise if you would. Let God butt into your situation. Uh, God, butt into my life here, God. And God said, well, just use my word and use that excellency of power that's in you. Uh, He said, we may be pressing, uh, just recently, uh, I went and had uh, one of these MRIs just because, you know, it was a health inspection and all that stuff. So, and I have great health. And God, thank you, Lord. And so, and I've had MRIs, you know, over the years. And you get in that tube and you go in there. But something happened up at one of our great medical institutions in the area here. They have two different sizes of MRI tubes. Some of y'all are getting chills when I start talking about getting in an MRI tube, one of those tunnels. And I've never been claustrophobic like that. And so I just go in the tube and they do their little thing. They get out and say, oh my goodness, you know. Uh, He looks like an angel. That's my opinion. (laughs) Gosh, I can't believe I said that. And uh, I believe they don't say that. But anyway, they have two different sizes. And so accidentally, I assume, now look, I'm 235 pounds of walking, talking, breathing, Cindy, please, and satisfaction. Y'all know what I mean? I am, I am not 55 pounds. Are y'all listening to me? They stuck me in the, the tube for children. And so as I'm going in that tube head first, y'all know what I'm talking about? And it's, it's inching me in there. My shoulders are touching the sides. My nose is almost on the top. And I'm like, I don't ever remember this experience. And my little pea brain began to spin and say, you're trapped. You can't get out of here. And then they give you a little thing like this in your hand, you know, you squeeze. So if you, if you start getting, you know, claustrophobic and panicking, and I've never done that ever in my life, ever. I've been through many extreme circumstances in life and panic is just not one of my issues. But something clicked and said, if you had to get out of here, you, could, you don't have room to even inch your way out of it. And do y'all know what it is to feel like you have worms? I mean, flat worms, that's the worst kind too. You know what I mean? Just worms, just, oh my goodness. And I'm thinking, you better get me out of here or where do you want a whole 
tore in this thing. And they, they just backed me right back out. I said, look, I know I hadn't gained that kind of weight. And I'm, what happened? They said, oh, we're sorry, Mr. Hallam. This was a mistake. Uh, this is in the small tube that we use for children and stuff. I said, well, where's the big tube? And forget it, I'm not getting in that one either right now. <laughs> it may take me a year to get over it for all I know. Oh my goodness. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying we're troubled on every side, hemmed in, pressed in. But he said we're never hemmed in to a, that there's not a way out. And then he said, and I think it's just very powerful, uh, uh, even though we feel distressed, we're not stopped. We are perplexed, but not in despair. A, a beautiful Greek word. It's the word aporeo, aporio. And it means to have somebody who is uh, disillusioned or someone who has become distressed and kind of lost their way. They're disoriented is a better word. Uh, he said, sometimes we may go through these uh, seemingly disorientations, but he said, we're never in despair. Uh, I'm going to break it down into our language today. He said, I'm never at my wits end without hope. Amen. He said, I don't care what the situation, I may not know what to do in the moment, but I'm never without hope. Yes. Yes. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. That's really important to get it in your spirit. He said, we're persecuted. Paul said, we're persecuted sometimes. D-I-O-K-O, diako. It's used often in the scriptures. Uh, a word, it means to be pressured. It could be uh, to be chased, to be followed, be pursued. He said, but we're never forsaken. The word forsaken, a beautiful word, and it means to be left alone, uh, to sit by yourself, never just be Myself, by myself. Paul says, look, I may feel like I'm being pursued, but I know that if I'm in the highest heaven or the lowest hell, that the Lord is going to be with me. Somebody shout hallelujah. I don't care what you're going through and when you're going through it, and I've been through it, and so have you, and you may go through something in the future because you are having the excellency of the power of God on the inside of you. The thing to do, listen, Holy Ghost style, kingdom style, word style, Christian style, uh, when, when you feel like you're being pressed in, he's saying, pop a top again. I'm not talking about booze. I'm talking about the excellency of the power that's in this container. Come on, take the lid off, pop the top. He said, because you are never alone. Just because the Holy Spirit is in you doesn't mean he's gonna work with you until you release him. Look at two people and say, it's the best message I've heard all morning. Come on, tell them that. He said, we are cast down, but not destroyed. I'll finish with this right here. I wish I could go further. Paul said, listen to it. I'm cast down. It's one of my favorite Greek words. Paul uses it over and over. It's the word katabalo, K-A-T-A-B-A-L-L-O, katabalo. And the word balo uh, literally means to, to repetitively throw something or, or hit it in, until you pierce it all the way through, until it breaks through. The word katabalo, this literally means to come down hard. And Paul is saying, uh, we may be uh, cast down, but we're not destroyed. Katabalo. Uh, in this particular thing, it also means uh, to strike something and to knock it over. It says something could be knocked down, but not destroyed. And that word destroyed is a beautiful word. And it's also used numerous times all through the Bible. If you, uh, the New Testament, Paul uses it a lot. In Greek, it's the word apolumai, A-P-O-L-L-U-M-I, apolumai. If you've heard me teach, you've heard it many times in Paul's writings. And the word literally means to be destroyed or to lose something. He said, we might be knocked down, but you know where this is going right now. Because in its application, it means I'm knocked down, but I'm never knocked out. Come on, someone say it with me. I may get knocked down, but I'm never knocked out. 
You know, can I just tell you that the, the one person that you never want to get into a fight or a conflict with, first of all, no one, hopefully, but the one person for sure you never want to get in a battle with is the person who just refuses to stop. I don't care what happens. You can knock him down seven times and he'll get up. And that's exactly what the Bible says. A righteous man may fall seven times, but he'll get up. So he said it like this. Do not rejoice over me, O my enemy, when I fall. For when I fall, come on, say it. I shall arise. He said, when I fall, I shall arise. You may be living here in this world, but what your adversary, the devil, can't do is change what's on the inside of you. If you've been born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, His Spirit lives on the inside of you, the biggest restriction is not what's going on out here in this frail earthen vessel. The biggest restriction is you until you take the lid off and start pouring out the anointing. Come on, that's what praising in the midnight hour does. Paul and Silas in jail, midnight hour. In all these things, all these things, he would say, we are more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens us. I think we ought to give God a shout of praise right now. That's why we read, we study the Word of God, we prepare. You may get down, you may get down for a little while, but come on, take the lid off. Open your mouth. Open your heart and mind. Lift your hands. Begin to praise. Begin to pray. Not the woe is me stuff. Uh, it's like, uh, devil, this attack out here, God's about to butt into it. But I'm never knocked out. I may be knocked down. Anybody ever been through a bad time? You ever been through a bad time? You ever been through a financial bad time? Yes. You're like, God, where are you? And he's like, I'm on the inside. Let me, let me loose. Uh, I'm inside. Turn me loose. Still small voice in there talking to you. Let, uh, turn me loose. Out of your innermost belly will flow rivers of living water. This I'm talking about the Holy Ghost. Since you have now received the Spirit of God on the inside. I mean, you, you, can, you can keep the lid on all you want. And you can let your crazy mind get blocked in like that, and you're like, you better get me out of here or else. <laughs> or how about pour out the Holy Ghost? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about praying in other tongues? Yeah. Building yourself up on your most holy faith. Yeah. Pray in tongues. Build yourself up. Yeah. No, you don't have to lose. One of the greatest statements I, my dad told me when I was a boy, he said, I'm going to tell you something, Walter. If you'll learn to think this way, it'll be real. It'll be a great day for you. Your fight's not over till you win. Amen. The fight's never over till you win. Your fight's not over till you win. Turn that power loose. You're a vessel. You're a container. You're the perfume bottle, an earthen vessel, frail. You're a clay jar. You've been on the potter's wheel. He's made you. If you've got cracks in the wheel, the Bible says he'll remake it for you because you're the container. Paul said, it is the mystery of all mysteries that God would live in man. To learn more, visit WalterHallam.com. You will find a list of resources to help you in your daily walk with Christ.